Welcome back, everyone, to our monthly Medipack luncheon meeting. Um, today, we're very honored to have with us um, Shireen Asagol, who are Kusani from Interface Carpets. And uh, before I introduce him to the stage, I'd like to just run through our upcoming events. On Monday to Wednesday next week, we have a uh, workshop, training workshop for a sustainability framework with Robert Steele, uh, uh, Alex, and myself. So there's no time to sign up for that. And um, you know, every two months we have a networking night or fill the screen that alternate. And um, this month we uh, we will change the format slightly to a panel discussion, and it's called Fueling the Future. And the, the panelists uh, are Dr. Biasawa, former uh, energy minister, and Dr. Shara from the Department of Climate Energy, and this is the third one, Peter Dupont, um, a policy uh, consultant for energy in Thailand. So it will be a very interesting um, panel on energy, and we're expecting you know more than 100 people. A lot of them will be our MBA executive MBA students. Um, and it's, it's on, did we change the room? When is it? When is it? Oh, it's on the, the 26th of this month in, at Sussex Hall here in the afternoon. And there are, there's also going to be uh, food from uh, various uh, vendors. And um, next month, we are trying to get somebody from uh, Bridgestone Tires to come and speak at Nemecat. But that is to be confirmed, and we'll let you know as soon as we have the confirmation. We have a trip to Interface on December 17. And, uh, and then we'll be back, you know, after the new year um, with more stuff. And then we'll have the film screening next time in February. So no, no film screening for, for a while because right. December is very busy. Lots of uh, events around town. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Kutsani. Thank you, Brian. And uh, it's, I feel like, very honored to be here today. Speaking to all of you, um, I have to confess that this is probably the first time I've ever given a talk outside of the factory. So pardon me if um, I stumble a little bit here and there. Uh, you know, this is such a highly—I was talking to Dennis—highly educated crowd that uh, I'm afraid what I'm going to say probably sounds childish to you guys. Or something like that. And furthermore, you know, I attended uh, Alan's uh, talk in, uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, it's hard act to follow, you know, singing on the guitar. And okay, so um, I'm not uh, a sustainability expert, first of all. I've been working for Interface for 11 years in the operations side of the business. But obviously, I've been ingrained in the vision of uh, sustainability for Interface for 11 years. And I thought I'd share with you some of the things that we've been doing in all of the Interface factories around the world. I start off with a few slides on who we are first, in case you don't know who we are. We are Interface, the world's leading modular carpet company. Why modular? I'll talk about that. It's basically a square carpet house, 50 by 50 centimeters. We are, we have been in the carpet business for 40 years, a 1.2 billion dollar company. Globally, we have six manufacturing sites around the world with 37 companies. And where are we located? Uh, our headquarters is in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, which is currently being famous for something it shouldn't be, which is the Ebola CDC battle going on over there. Um, and we produce about 22 million square meters of carpet a year in the United States, covering North and South America. The second part is the European region. We have factories in Northern Ireland and Holland, um, and that covers all of Europe and Africa. This map is a little bit old. Uh, Middle East and India now belongs to the Asia Pacific region, where we have factories in China, Thailand, in Chonburi, Amatangkorn, and one in uh, Australia as well, about an hour's drive from Sydney. So basically, we've got the entire planet covered with carpets here. The market segments that we uh, operate in hospitality, government sector, education. Unfortunately, Sase doesn't use a carpet because you're going to have to rectify some of yeah, yes. uh, Healthcare. And the biggest market is obviously the corporate centers. So, you know, some of your net impact uh, members all probably use a carpet, you know, such as Unilever or 
DuPont, etc. And it is probably the biggest uh, segment for us. Okay, so what do we offer uh, for our customers in the interface? Um, I really like this line because it covers basically what we offer. You know, a carpet is made out of many different layers. The top layer that you see is obviously the design. Uh, being a world leader, our design is obviously very innovative, um, uh, very uh, quick to come to market as well. You know, there's competitors copying left and right, which could be a good or a bad thing. Um, we back that design up with performance. Our carpets are guaranteed 15 years uh, of, of the shelf life, basically. You can use it for 15 years with proper maintenance, of course, and obviously we got good service, but the core of it is sustainability. I'll touch base briefly on the design part, and then the rest I'll go into the sustainable aspects of our performance and service and products as well. This guy is called David Oki. He's a world-renowned carpet designer. Uh, you guys probably don't know him. Uh, most designers probably don't know him, but those who operate in the carpet industry know him very well. He's been in the business for 20 years, and he's been coveted by all of our competitors, but we've held him in, in, in place so far. So this is all the wonderful stuff that he has invented and designed. Okay, so 20 years ago, as I'm certain all of you know, Ray Anderson had an epiphany. He said that um, everything has to change, basically. Uh, he was invited to speak, as the story goes, invited to speak on um, the subject of what this interface is doing for the environment. This was about 20 years ago. And he came up blank. He said, all we are doing is meeting the basic law requirements. And 20 years ago, legislation was kind of lax. Yeah. So Ray said, one day, people like me will go to jail. You know, that's how strong the epiphany he had. He, said, he realized that we're causing a lot of damage to the environment. So Ray then decided to take us on this bold vision, you know, no compass, no direction. Here he goes running off. Um, and let me tell you, uh, I've, I've been in touch with uh, a lot of the um, our CEOs and you know, CFOs and COOs that were very close to Ray when he first started this journey. And they were all against Ray about taking his path. So the key component of being successful is you need a boss that is bullheaded, you know, really strong. You know, I, I, I want to do it. Without Ray, I think it would have been really difficult to turn this sort of titanic around, you know, and, and avoid the disaster. That went on. So Ray said he wanted to do something called Mission Zero. Okay. Uh, our company started up in 1973. He had his epiphany in about 1993. And he started his vision in 1994 and set a target for the year 2020 to reach that goal. He went and did some study and research. Has any of you read this book called Ecology of Commerce? No? Yeah. Have you had any of read Ray's book called Mid-Course Correction? No? Okay, so, uh, well, after Ray read Ecology of Commerce, I'll just briefly summarize what he, uh, what he discovered from this book that created this spear in the chest kind of moment. Basically, Paul Hawkins said that, this is 20 years ago, right? 20 or 30 years ago, he said, it's a substantially reduced impact that each of us has on the environment, and we need to imagine a life where less is more satisfying, more interesting, and more secure. And when I think about it in modern days, I think about the king's self-sufficiency economy, you know, it kind of falls into that, you know, the less is more satisfying, more interesting. It doesn't mean you have to be minimalist, you know, uh, reductionist, you know, it doesn't mean you shouldn't have children. You know, some people said, you know, too much population, you should stop having kids. Uh, but it's, it talks about, you know, having the quality of life and, and considering the impact that you're, you're, uh, you're leaving behind for future generations. And how did Paul imagine that we should accomplish this? Not surprisingly. Entirely eliminate waste from our industrial productions. Convert from fossil fuel to renewable energy and create systems of accountability and response that support and strengthen restorative behavior. And to me, I think the third one is probably the hardest. The second one, technology is coming along. We're, we're seeing more and more renewable energy coming online. So the first one, we also are starting to see a lot of industries uh, taking into account the waste that they're generating, despite the fact that you're meeting some resistance as well. You change that. But the third one, you know, I think it, it requires um, the community, the state, 
will also play a role. And this is very difficult uh, to assume. But that's something that Paul had envisioned. And not surprisingly, back then when he lost his book, he was denounced as a, you know, a, 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 the devil against capitalism and, and, and all that stuff. So he had a tough time selling his book even back then. So Ray read this book, had an epiphany, and he came up with his own vision. And his vision is to be the first company that by its deeds shows the entire industrial world what sustainability is in all its dimensions. People, process, product, place, and profits by 2020. And in doing so, we will become restorative through the power of influence. Ray Anderson being great, he wasn't satisfied with sustainable products. He wanted sustainability in all aspects of the five Ps. And that is why some of his uh, very close associates were you know, kind of taken aback by this, this very bold move. And the power of influence was Ray wasn't satisfied with just changing the face, but he wanted to change the world. So he wanted to influence all stakeholders, starting with suppliers, with the community. He actually was on the um, Clinton Administration's Council for Sustainability for a couple of years as well. So he tried to spread his influence you know, into the government sector as well. Now this, this vision statement, you know, when, when we try to um, explain it in Thailand, especially in different languages in China, it's a bit difficult to, it's, it's, it's difficult to digest it. So then we decided to shorten it a little bit, but still retain most of the essential meaning. And we call it Mission Zero, our promise to eliminate any negative impact our company may have on the environment by the year 2020. And then this is where Mission Zero uh, came about. What is Mission Zero? Well, basically Mission Zero asks some fairly difficult questions. How can a industry that is based on petrochemicals uh, achieve zero impact? And if we were able to eliminate the impact, will our customers appreciate it? Yeah. You know, uh, can we sell virtual carpets? Probably not yet. Uh, but you know, those, those are the things that uh, are challenging questions. Yeah. Or can a corporation do well and do good at the same time? So Ray uh, looked inward for us at our product. And he said that our products are modular. Right? So does modular provide any sustainable aspect for the customer? Of the service. And sure enough, he said, yeah, yeah it does. You know? yeah, it's easy to change. It allows you to um, uh, create different zones of, of uh, 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 mood or ambience that you want in a habitat. It's easy to manage, handle, and store. You know, it's very easy to remove. It's, a, it's, it's a environmental friendly for uh, well-being in, in the sense that there is um, uh, not a lot of POCs being released by the carpet, etc., etc. Then you say, okay, besides the product, what about the other aspects? Our customers, you know, we want to apply zeroism everywhere you know, to our customers, in our products, in terms of raw materials, in our factories, in terms of uh, process, the process of manufacturing carpet, and the value chain as well, you know, transportation in just about every aspect, which basically covers the product. So after all of that discussion brainstorming, Ray came up with what he calls the seven fronts of sustainability. Or interface. One, we aim to eliminate waste. Two, we aim to eliminate harmful emissions. Three, use renewable energy. Four, closing the loop. Five, resource efficient transportation. Six, sensitizing stakeholders. And seven, redesign commerce. And I go through each one quickly. Eliminate waste. Carpet, the carpet industry 20, 30 years ago was mainly broad loop, uh, roll carpets, right? very big rolls of carpet. Obviously, when you install these broadleaf carpets, you get a lot of waste, 12% waste. When you go to tile carpets, you, you reduce that waste down to about 3 to 4%. Then when you go to randomly laid tiles, you reduce that even further to 1 to 2%. And the reason why this innovation driving towards randomness is because Ray wanted to reduce waste. So that was the driving factor behind it. Sure, uh, it made our carpet um, sell a lot more. You know, customers were were um, impressed by the fact that um, they are helping the environment to reduce waste. And that helped in the marketing sense. Yeah. But, so that's part of doing well by doing good. Our designs then, our designers then went out and said, okay, instead of just making it random patterns, they went out and studied nature and they said, we're going to incorporate biomimicry into our product. 
So they went out and studied nature and they saw the leaves in autumn time, you know, this is America. Uh, gravel road, pavements, and they said, wow, look, it's all random, but it looks like there's a design pattern. So they copied that into this carpet called entropy and basically uh, reduced the waste and also uh, created, uh, the insulation waste was reduced, manufacturing waste was reduced, because when traditional uh, directional carpet, you need to you need to ensure that you've got tile number one, two, three, four laid in a certain direction in a certain way. If you don't have tile number four, you gotta go make another tile, right? Produce and manufacture another tile. Mm -hmm. But randomly laid, you can just throw them on the floor. Insulation wise, the guys that install, they don't have to go and you know look at the back of the tile. The arrow's pointing this way, that way. It takes a lot of time and waste. So with random carpet, you just throw it on the floor, and you've got this random pattern. So that, that helped. Attic stock meaning uh, we sold some carpets to um, hotels and when they need to replace a carpet, first of all, you replace a broad room carpet, you replace the, the whole play roll, right? You gotta remove it. But with carpet tiles, you just replace one time. And then the, um, uh, you would, in the past, you would need a special installer to come and replace it. With carpet tiles, you keep a box in the maid's quarter when there's a cigarette burns or something mark. Just the maid just goes pick up another piece and put it back and uh, replace that, that tile. And because it's randomly made, especially using a random like product, you know, the maid doesn't even have to look which direction it's coming. So that is the sustainable aspect of the product in the design. How about selling the product? When we sell products, we uh, create sample folders and books, thousands and thousands, of them, and we send them to the sales team, we send them to our our dealers right? and customers have them in their, in their offices. After a while, they throw them away. You know, it becomes waste. So we even incorporate a program where we return all those samples uh, to be disassembled, reused, and recycled properly as well. How about um, carpet samples? You know, we used to send out actual carpet, physical carpets to the customers to look to view. Then we developed the technology to print them on paper. So we, we, we print out a 50 by 50 centimeter piece of paper that looks exactly like carpet from a distance. We won't look at that close. So customers were happy with seeing carpets on the floor and they were able to choose from just a paper printout. <coughs> then we went to the next step of technology which was developed on 3D animation on, 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 uh, on the computer. Now you don't need any paper, right? So the customer, we take the picture of this insulation, for example, this floor, we superimpose the, the carpet that you need onto the picture. And then you can keep changing that until you're satisfied with whatever type of carpet you want to be, to be on this floor. And therefore, you close the sales without even using a single piece of sample. And that's part of the uh, sustainable aspect in the, in the selling and marketing side. How about in the process side? We wanted to have zero water in our manufacturing process. We know that water is a valuable resource. So, um, I don't know if you, you, you know it, but uh, Ray actually worked for another company before he started in the face, which was basically doing uh, printing carpet. So what, what they would do is uh, a tough white yarn carpet. Right? It was great for supply chain purposes. They could print, uh, produce all of this, tons and tons of uh, uh, white carpet. And then you would use these printers to print ink on the on the, on the, on the Of course, there are, there are advantages. Right? You could print small quantities and, and et cetera, et cetera. But Ray thought it was not very sustainable. He was right. The ink that you use, uh, you've got to uh, get rid of it somehow, or manage it, store it somehow. What do you do with it? The water that is needed to do the printing process has to be treated before it's returned back into the environment. So that's why Ray decided to exit the printing business. And currently, our, our carpets are tufted from colored yarn. So they're extruded, extruded into that specific color and then tough it into a pack. There are no printing process involved at all. And Ray said, hey, that's great, you know, no environmental permits are needed. Those those babies are expensive as well. So again, that's doing good by doing well. Not doing well by doing good. How about the um, even our cutting process? When you visit our factory, you'll see if you visit our factory that carpet is still being uh, manufactured in a roll. So it's still being manufactured in a roll, and at the very last process it's cut into the square. And traditional cutting in squares is that they have these window frames, right? So every time you cut, you have a window frame. 
and those window frames are strapped with. So we developed an ultrasonic cutting machine that actually can cut without window frames and eliminate a lot of the space as well. Uh, some of these have not been incorporated into the tie factory, but uh, certainly in Europe, in Australia, and in America, it's already been incorporated. And of course, last but not least, you know, zero landfill, uh, that's <coughs> another goal that uh, Interface strives not to send any of our carpets to landfill. And uh, for the many, many years now, we have, we have achieved that target already, which is zero waste to landfill. And you know that when it goes to landfill, it's not just carbon dioxide that's being generated, but it's the methane, which is 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Okay, so that's fund number one. Front number two, eliminate harmful emissions. So how are we going to do that? Let's cool down the, the planet, we say. Basically, um, we aren't able yet to eliminate all the carbon dioxide that we generate in manufacturing, so we're going to offset it. So we have this cool carpet program where we uh, plant trees to offset the carbon dioxide that's being generated. Customers get a nice little plaque to say that their office is carbon neutral. And our, our carbon neutral carpets uh, is unique in that we, it covers the full life cycle of the carpet, not just from the manufacturing. And you'll see in a little bit that manufacturing generates only about 10 to 20 percent of the carbon dioxide that, that is emitted. So we cover the whole chain, the life cycle of the carpet, from material extraction right, until the end of life use as well. And they are certified by third party. We also do um, what's called cool commute in, in our factories. So employees uh, log the, the, the distance that they drive from work to home, or home to work. And uh, we also offset those miles as well. As well as air miles are being recorded, logged on, and, and offset it. Even the fuel purchases, this is done in the US. The, the, the bottom two are in the US. The top one is done just about every, every factory. The, the bottom one is transport because the US is uh, uses uh, trucks as a main mode of transport. So all of the miles that they, 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 they deliver goods have been offset for carbon as well. We've got um, VOCs. Are you aware of VOCs? Volatile organic compounds. Nasty stuff like benzene, formaldehyde. You know, a lot of these furnitures, they emit uh, VOCs for at least 28 days. I don't know why they, 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 they use 28 days. Any relation to do with um, that zombie movie, right? 28 days. <coughs> After 28 days, you know, the carpet stars are not safe. No, I'm not sure. sure. But anyway, after 28 days, uh, they, they check the VOC. Well, actually, they check the VOC at day one and then check it at, at the end of the day. And carpet tiles are one of the lowest emitting, at least interface carpet is one of the lowest emitting um, uh, materials that you can find in uh, office buildings. And these are all like uh, very stringent uh, European as uh, test standards. Front number three, use renewable energy. Give you 10 baht if you can tell me what that picture is. It says here, factory feeds on biogas from fish and chocolate waste. Squid? Fish. Yeah, maybe squid as well, all kinds of fish. Uh, basically, this one, Skirpenseal, is the name of our factory in Holland. It's a town in Holland. Um, they are buying uh, gas from uh, this, this manufacturer. Uh, it's a private, private energy company that actually uh, creates biogas from waste from fish and chocolate. So, you know, this is again following into a bit of Paul Hawkins, you know, waste is food kind of, kind of concept. So your waste is my food, my energy. And, and it's being shared amongst, amongst the um, industrial industries in, in Europe. In Asia, I have to say it's a bit more difficult to find renewable energy. I don't know if you guys have found any. If you have, then I'd like to share some as well. Renewable energy, solar energy. <coughs> um, all of our pipes are insulated. Uh, this is because in the US and Europe, it can get pretty cold. Right? So, prevent thermal loss, they insulate all their pipes. Uh, we also um, check for leakages in all of our air compressing uh, pipes, uh, connectors at, at each connecting point, make sure that there's no air leakages. 
So in terms of um, eliminate uh, re re renewable energy, uh, I have to admit that we haven't gone very far, at least in Asia. But in the U.S. and Europe, you know, they're making headways, and we're struggling with it in Asia. Front number four is closing the loop. Okay, we are all familiar with the concept of closing the loop. Uh, uh, so what is interface going to do or has done in this, in this past few years? But basically, we've diverted you know, a lot of carpets from landfill in this re-entry program. This is the grid diagram that I was talking about uh, on carbon emission, global warming. What we found is that only 10% of our carpet that is manufactured 10% of carbon is needed from the manufacturing process. 71% is coming from the raw material extraction. And that's why it's very important that we uh, try to make our suppliers as sustainable as we are. And, and we've been quite successful at this, in, this, in this aspect, which I'll show you a bit later. Uh, usage and maintenance, 97%. Uh, end of life and transportation is 3%. So basically, we want to close this loop. We don't want to extract new materials and we don't want it to go to landfill. How are we going to do that? Currently, all carpets in the US are shipped back to Georgia, the British. Used carpet, by the way, I'm sorry. Uh, so the customer, if, uh, for example, if Sussex wants to change the carpet, you know, we can remove the carpet from, it has to be interface carpet, though, because we're not sure of our competitors' carpet, what they're using in their vacuum materials and in their yarn. But if it's interface carpet, we know what, what's in there. We can remove it from the floor, replace it with new carpet. And then the old carpet is sent back to be rounded up, separated into fiber and vacuum through an agglomerator system, pellets. And then it becomes what we call cool blue food. But uh, basically it goes into a machine that then comes, comes out as a, as a new vacuum for the, for the next generation of carpets. In, um, in China, we already have uh, a partner that is doing the re-entry program. And in Thailand, uh, in January, I'm going to be launching a re-entry made in Thailand. So currently, we're, we're buying re-entry banking from Japan, all the way from Japan, very expensive. Uh, but uh, we found some suppliers in, in Thailand that are able to do the same process, similar process, uh, fairly you know, inexpensive. So in January, uh, we'll have local DMT. OK, front number five, resource efficient transportation, transforming supply chain towards mission zero. First of all, establishing manufacturing sites near your, uh, your customers. And that, that fact, uh, Ray has actually thought about you know, shipping in, in, in before we had factories in Asia Pacific. We thought about selling carpets all the way from the U.S. to China, to Thailand, to Australia. And he said, well, one, it's not sustainable, you know, all that long distance of travel. Two, obviously, there are uh, economic factors involved as well, commercial uh, implications. And you want to be the, the leader, right? You've got to be at the source as well. So this is one aspect that um, drove Ray to, <coughs> to um, expand the factories around the continent. We, this is more. Uh, uh, relevant to the U.S. and Europe, where they've shifted to more lower uh, carbon modes of transportation, such as where railways and barges. But this applies to all sites, improving transport efficiency. On average, our trucks are 85 to 90 percent uh, full. So that's another way of you know, ensuring that you are being equal efficient. Front number six. This is a popular one in Thailand. You know, a sensitizing stakeholders, CSR program. Uh, we actually have a, we have a, we have a um, relationship with the vill a village in Surin, which is the eastern province, and uh, we donate a lot of our uh, waste yarn to them, and we've taught them how to make hammocks out of it. So so we've got nylon yarn uh, turned into hammocks, uh, where they can then sell and make a living out of it uh, when they're not farming, basically. And recently we've been also teaching them how to make these little toy. Uh, stuffed dolls, I guess, yeah. and they're all made from uh, the waste yarns that we have left over. We also um, collaborate with Father, just by coincidence, there's an orphanage in Papia run by Father Ray, so we hooked up with them as a Father Ray Foundation, uh, 
And we, we also do a lot with the children there as well. Green Apple Day, uh, this is more of an American concept, Green Apple Day. Uh, CSR program with the students, and we particularly try to choose um, uh, rural students, uh, rural rural in the community as well. Spending a day with the children that you believe in. Wildlife conservation is pretty standard stuff that I'm sure all of you are doing. Um, community projects, this, this one was um, for Amata and Pond. They wanted, they actually had a competition of more than hundreds of um, uh, uh, companies from different industrial estates, from the north, to the south, to the east, and they had a competition of each industrial estate to come up with uh, products made from uh, waste of each, each, each uh, industry. And then we had a competition, we went to, I can't remember where, but they gave out an award and we interfaced in fifth place. Not bad. <laughs> Trying to make uh, stools, purses, you know, um, all kinds of stuff from the waste. Yeah. Mission Zero Week, uh, we, have, we have a kind of like um, what we call the Mission Zero Champions in the factory. Uh, basically, every department has uh, nominates one employee, and they meet once a month, and they just, you know, there's events, activities surrounding on how to promote sustainability in the factory, as well as for these community service projects as well. And this, this stuff is going on uh, in the U.S. as well, so it's, it's everywhere. Okay, front number seven is the one that I find the most interesting, uh, redesigning columns. Uh, basically, all it means is, to me, it means looking for innovation, innovative ways, thinking out of the box. How are we going to do things in a sustainable way, um, you know, without limitation to the way it's been done before. And one of those in, in innovations came out is called tactile. Tactile is like a square piece of um, adhesive. Normal, normal insulation of carpets is you put glue basically on the floor, on the ceiling floor, roll it you know, on the floor, and then you lay the carpets on top. If you look at that red circle there, that's how much impact on the environment um, traditional uh, uh, adhesive um, uh, generates. But the green little dot there is how much tactile turns. Because tactile adheres to the four corners of the carpet, so it, it turns the whole um, uh, multiple tiles of carpet into just one gigantic piece, right? and it, it holds it on, onto the floor without any adhesive on the cement floor. So when you remove the carpet, you, there's no cleaning up to it. There's no adhesive because that, that little piece is stuck on the back of it. And a piece of plastic there, tactile, is also recyclable. So that's one of the innovations that came out of redesign and And you can see here again the impact, the amount of adhesive used is 110 grams. Even um, we, we even thought about sustainable installation for our customers. You know, when, when you want to install the carpet here, you've got to move all the furniture off. Right? So we developed a mechanical system that actually lifts, lifts the furniture up off the floor, just like when you're changing your car tire. You lift it up the floor, and then you can change and remove the carpet as well. All of these innovations, you know, again, driven by sustainability. Zero ha hassle maintenance, basically, uh, this is just highlighting the fact that um, when you want to clean our carpets, you don't need to use solvents or detergents. All you need is hot water. And it's called hot water extraction. There's a machine that actually uh, spits out hot water on the carpet, and it sucks it back in, and it cleans the carpet out. So again, you know, maintenance, um, hassle-free, because it's just like a you know, machine that goes around, automated sometimes. And you don't need any um, uh, uh, harmful chemicals to put in the carpet. Lead building. I'm sure you've heard of lead. Yeah, leadership in energy and environmental design. Uh, the Thai factory in, in Chunburi here is the first lead certified building in Thailand. Yeah. So we are uh, obviously we've, we've done leads before in, in, in the U.S. and it's come to Thailand in 2007. If you check at the registration now, there's probably thousands of lead buildings. Some of our lead certified buildings around um, interface. The showroom in Atlanta is lead platinum certified. Lead has different uh, certification levels. Um, Shanghai showroom is lead gold. The factory in, in the U.S. and Thailand is lead certified. Because we were the first lead certified building in Thailand, 
we had a challenge because we couldn't find any lead certified materials. Unless we were to import them, and then that defeated the whole purpose of doing lead in the first place. So we were content with just doing lead certification. The factory in China is lead platinum certified. They've got stuff like, um, if they've, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, inserted pipes underground there. I don't know how many miles of pipes underneath to suck out the um, cool air. Because in China, in winter time, it's very cold, in summer, it's very hot. So what they do is they call it, um, uh, what do they call it, thermal, thermal air conditioning or something like that. So in summertime, the air from underground coming out to the vents is at 25 degrees Celsius, right, underground air, where, whereas ambient temperature is 40. So you're getting air conditioning. In winter time, the ambient temperature in, 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 in the factory is about, say, zero degrees. Sometimes it goes down at zero. Uh, you're still getting 25 degrees of air coming out of the vent, it becomes a heater. So, those are some of the things that adds on about 10 to 20 percent cost to building construction. You know, but again, that is, uh, if you have the um, sustainability um, vision for driving it, uh, money's a side issue, I guess. Uh, the biggest impact on, on, on the environment that our carpet is in the yarn itself. Right? So we said, let's see how we can um, reduce that impact. Three, three, three ways of doing it. Use less yarn, use recycled yarn, and then to new yarn. Less yarn is basically a product we call micro tough that uh, basically it's just tufting it's really, really thin and really, really low. Uh, again, there are niche markets for those. Uh, some customers want a minimalist kind of design, so we do create that. Uh, uh, that product to meet the demands of the market as well as to reduce the usage of materials. Using recycled yarn, currently 400 of our colors are 100% recycled yarn. We have this project called Networks, uh, which is a collaboration with um, some partners. And what, what we're doing is uh, we're collecting used fishing nets from villages in the Philippines. Because the Philippines um, have a big fishing community there, right? and all the used nets are being thrown back in you know, waste into the ocean, it's actually harming marine life. So we went in there and we said we started a program where the uh, villagers would collect these fishing nets. Um, and we have a community center. We're not paying them in money, but we're actually paying them in rice. Uh, so we're, we're exchanging barter, barter expenses. You give us back the fishing nets, we give you X amount of kg of rice. In the exchange. The fishing net are then sent back to the yarn manufacturer and it's being recycled into the version yarn. Of course, the, the, the fishing net is not the only source of recycled nylon, but it is a, a very um, inspirational source, I would say, that, that drives the engagement of, of, our, of our employees as well as the community. And this program is going to be expanded into other countries. This is the pilot program that was started about two years ago. And let's invent a new yarn. Okay, we remember earlier I said um, we we want to reduce waste and this and that. Uh, one of the th one of the concept of Paul Hawking was that um, he, he he classified waste into three three types: right? consumer waste, uh, product service based waste, and the hazardous waste. So consumer waste, he said, how do you get rid of it? You can recycle. Yeah, we're doing recycling, but what we're actually doing is downcycling. You recycle it a few times, at the end of life, what is it going to do? It's going to either go to landfill or get burned for energy. And when you burn for energy, you release dioxin into the air. So you're actually, you know, not really reducing your impact. So what Paul suggested was to use uh, biodegradable materials. And this is what we've now developed in the interface. It's a biodegradable yarn, which is made out of castor beans. I don't know if you ever heard of castor beans. In Rome, Primarily in India, it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a crop that uh, survives in very harsh conditions. It only needs to be watered twice a year, unbelievable, and it provides a lot of this castor bean oil that is then converted into yarn material. Currently, it is still a little bit expensive, but we're working towards uh, a, a really commercial, commercially viable solution. We do have products made out of castor bean biodegradable yarn. And of course, 
last but not least, biomimicry. You know, this is another one of my favorite subjects in biomimicry. Um, how are we going to uh, become restorative? Like I said, you know, we're reducing waste, we're minimizing uh, energy usage, minimizing mater dematerializing, de-engineering a product. Uh, there's going to be a limit to that. And, and is that really the end game? The end game is to be uh, one with nature, yes, uh, but how we can take it. And, and, and biomimicry basically is going to teach us how to live together with nature. Um, the concept of your waste is, is my, my food, my energy. Uh, there are now industries in, in Europe that have, have gotten together and said that your waste I can use, yeah, and my waste he can use. So they're now uh, creating links. And basically an industrial ecosystem is, is happening in Europe where they're actually sharing their waste and because the, the other guy can turn it into energy. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can learn from nature, um, which I'm not the expert in biomimicry, by the way, but um, you know I'm really inspired by it, and, and I think that this is going to be one of the next step in um, in the evolution of sustainability. Okay, so how do we measure um, our success okay. in in any organization if we want to drive sustainability? got to measure as well. Basically, Ray Anderson says, what gets measured gets done. If you don't measure it, no, most likely it's not going to get done. The three areas of measurement, product, LCAs, natural capital, we to measure that. Process, in terms of ecometrics, recycled content, energy usage, culture, in terms of social metrics, engagement level, safety. Um, the, the thing that I really like about interface is uh, the, the, the amount of um, energy and resources uh, that we put in into the people aspect as well of engagement and getting people to um, to be on board with sustainability. Carbon dioxide emission obviously is one thing that we measure. As you can see that uh, every square meter of carpet, our carbon dioxide emission has been constantly decreasing and we offset the rest. We've also measured the fact that yarn, like I was saying, is the biggest ma major contrib contributor of uh, carbon dioxide emission. And therefore, our focus is bio, um, bio yarn. And the success stories that we've enjoyed uh, over the past 10, 15 years, energy usage per unit is down by 39%. Renewable energy is now 35% of total energy use. Greenhouse gas emission is down by 71%. Recycled bio-based material is now 49% of our product. Waste landfill per unit is down by 83%. And water intake is 94%. Waste landfill uh, also includes our raw materials that are uh, our suppliers. So we include them as well. In the manufacturing side of our, of our facility, it's 0%. Five of five out of seven, well actually it's six because the US they count they count um, themselves as two because they're so big. Uh, uses uh, renewable energy. The Holland one is green from the grid, the solar energy as well. Great Haven is in uh, Northern Ireland. They're also buying green energy from the grid. Um, the US is made mostly a renewable energy credits for their money. And like I said, we don't see Asia Pacific up there at the moment. And that's something we need to rectify very soon as well. Last, the culture part. As I was saying, we have Mission Zero champions or ambassadors that we drive in our factory. Um, uh, our ambassadors are being developed so that they can actually come up here and speak, say the same thing that I'm talking here today. Um, in Thailand, that level is probably not as high as in the US of Europe yet, but that's where I plan to get to in one point in time. Uh, we, do, we have a quest, quest metrics that measures the, um, all the amount of waste that we generate, and we even create a what we call a quest project where employees are encouraged to, uh, uh, to put forward uh, any ideas that they have to, to save waste or to reduce our quality. Q12, you're familiar with that then? 
Q12 is basically an, an, uh, an organization for Gallup uh, that they they send out, they have these 12 questions where you can ask your employees to answer, to apply, and then we can gauge the level of engagement by, by, the, by the score. Some of the questions are things like, uh, you know, very basic stuff, like do you have the tools required to do it? Do you, do you have the opportunity to, to do what's best uh, in your interest every day? Things like that. So they're very, really challenging questions for employers to be able to uh, uh, ensure that the engagement level is high. So in summary, zero waste, renewable energy, and being accountable. That's what Interface is, is trying to promote, at least in the operation side, uh, touching base a bit on the sales and marketing side. And um, I hope, you know, I've been able to enlighten you a little bit at least <laughs> on what we've, we've done, maybe giving you some ideas on what you can uh, incorporate in your own organization. And I'll be happy to um, you know, discuss in further details if you have any questions. Okay.
like I said, you know, that same similar to the last question about that's that's one of the challenges is uh, using bio material at the moment is a bit more expensive than, than virgin material. Even using recycled material is a bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. But that is uh, why we are putting resources in terms of money and people. You know, we have four divisions that are R&D uh, working towards that goal. And again, that is the commitment coming from Ray Anderson's uh, uh, sustainability culture. You know, is that um, there has to be funds set aside to these kind of resources. And, and eventually, we, we do plan. You know, you asked me about five, I think five years ago, we tried uh, a bio-based yarn from corn, yeah. made from corn, PLA. Yeah. And we found limitations to the performance. Mm -hmm. But castor bean uh, performance is good. You know, and now the only stumbling block is the, is the commercial side of the house. Mm -hmm. so, so at least, you know, we're, we're, we're making progress. And we think that eventually we'll be able to find a solution, a commercially viable solution, that we can then launch more bio-based products. Excellent. For the, for the fire, maybe we saw that, of course, with the uh, biofuels, for instance, so that the crops from biofuels, yes. which then uh, creates a friction for, uh, for actually uh, uh, growing food, rather yes. than, uh, yeah, and uh, other governments uh, were supported uh, to by subsidies, uh, biofuel, but not, but not the food part, so the farmers uh, all started to grow uh, fuel, for fuel and not for food. Um, is that not a, uh, an additional risk if you go for yes. bio yarn, yes. and how many hectares uh, of our square kilometers or uh, of land we can eat or actually be able to use that crop to uh, uh, instead of the petrochemical? Yes, that's a good, oh. very, very good point. I think one of the reasons why we also uh, shelved the, the corn PLA part was because of that. You know, that it was uh, competing with um, food crops. And uh, we were also concerned about GMO crops as well. Because uh, corn has a lot of GMO stuff in there that uh, is not yet um, accepted. So uh, that was one of the reasons for, for, for stopping the, the program of using corn as, as a source. Bio, uh, these castor bean oils, um, I think we have thought long and hard about, about the, the, the impact on cash crop. And that's why they selected this, this particular plant, because it uh, does thrive in very harsh conditions. It can grow on sandy loam soils, so that uh, this, the kind of soil that normal cash crops would find difficult to, to grow anyways. Um, like I said, it uses very little water, yeah, and it's actually creating some income for you know, developing countries as well. So we did consider a lot of those impacts, and that's why the development of bio-based products is going a bit slower than, than what we do. We, we do take into consideration the, the, the impact of bio as well. It's very difficult to the child. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, do you have a plan or, or how, how do you educate the other companies or the public to use this bio product to plant into other industries? Well, um, I have to say that in, in Asia, we're not doing a lot of, of spreading the word, spreading the news, to be honest. And like I said, this is actually the first time that anybody in Thailand has come and spoken to you know, a crowd like you guys. You know, mostly our talks have been with uh, our, 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 our internal, internal stakeholders. Except for America, where Graham has been you know, talking about this you know, for the longest time. Um, but even then, you know, Ray doesn't go into really the specifics. Like with this presentation, I wanted to make sure that I touch a little bit on the specific stuff that we're doing and make it a bit more practical rather than just you know talking the same thing uh, about doing good. Um, but you know, one of my goal was to develop a relationship with an education uh, um, as well as the business sector. So maybe Sasin is, is going to be our future partner. We're going to spread the award revenue right here. <laughs> okay, okay, fine, that's good, that's good. And uh, we are also a member on, in the TBCSD, you know, the Thailand Business Sustainable Council. Um, although, uh, I have to say that it is a bit difficult as well to get our, our message across such a big uh, council. 
because there's so many you know, big names in there. Um, but yes, I think that is going to be something we need to develop in Asia as well. But however, you know, bio-based um, material is nothing really new nowadays. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of bio-plastic, um, bio-this, bio-that coming online. So I think, like I said, you know, that environment, the nature is forcing us to go this way anyway. So a lot of companies are now uh, thinking about this. You know, if, if I was to give this talk 20 years ago, people would probably, you know, not think I'm a coop or something, you know, what are you talking about? But uh, nowadays, you know, everybody everybody gets the message because every society is in the part of just about every organization, I think. Yeah? You mentioned one thing, uh, in, the, in, in the Netherlands you, you have 100% renewable energy use in your yes. factory. Yes. Uh, I would like to know how you achieve that. In, in the Amphor, yes. by the way, yes. uh, we don't have landfill, so you, you couldn't have, have waste for landfill. Yes. There's no landfill in the Netherlands. But, <coughs> but uh, uh, renewable energy, how do you achieve that? Uh, unless you produce it yourself. Um, you mentioned also that the Thailand is not meant uh, renewable energy. In fact, I think there is quite a bit. If you look at the percentage of renewable, renewable energy in Thailand produced towards the Netherlands, it's not really much different. The percentage. So, uh, but maybe where you are located, Right. You are uh, you are on a in, uh, uh, Amata, state. Amata, 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 you, uh, a little bit on the eastern seaboard. You need to draw your energy from the big grip Amata power plant, yes. right? So you got no option. <laughs> Whereas in the Netherlands, you can actually uh, uh, select your own uh, power yeah. Yeah. supply. Agree. Agree. Yeah. Well, in the Netherlands, uh, <laughs> we're not generating our own energy, but uh, we are buying it from the grid. Uh, you know, green energy. energy from the grid. You're right. Uh, you know, Netherlands wind energy is a big thing, solar energy is a big thing, and, and this uh, biogas, biofuel um, uh, energy is also the newest thing that they've been installed in China. And they call it green energy. So I don't know if you, if you call it green energy, you, you, you understand, but that's, that's what they call green energy. So, um, yes, I think in the Netherlands it's a proven fact that they can do 100% renewable. In Thailand, I've done a bit of research, and yes, there are some solar farms popping up here and there in uh, in Kantanapuri or something like that. Um, and I'm sure that within the, maybe the next three to five years, maybe they, they they could possibly contribute more to the grid. We are using, I think, we've calculated once uh, about one or two percent is coming from hydro hydro energy in, in Thailand. It's considered as green as well, uh, but in the grid, it's only about you know, one or two percent. Virtually unmeasurable. So, you know, if you have information about renewable, I'd be interested. Too. There's a lot of biogas or, or, or uh, energy created from waste. Yeah. But it's usually waste from factories. Yeah. But they're produced for their own. Yeah. So yeah, no, that it's not really the. the I agree. Sometimes they sell back to the grid. Aren't there companies that have enough uh, uh, factory waste to produce biogas? Yeah. In, uh, in fact, we are studying biogas at the moment. Uh, we have a supplier actually. He's using, he's burning, he's actually he's burning um, coconut, you know, coconut yes. husks yeah, as a biofuel. In a sense. But we're not really enamored with that yet at the moment. We're, we're still trying to find uh, a, a, a much more environmentally friendly yeah. kind, of, kind of biofuel biogas. So. Yeah, just on, on that topic, I think also the secondary generation for biofuel from uh, sugarcane uh -huh. is really changing also the landscape. So mm -hmm. I think also innovation is coming through. So basically, from the su sugarcane, you can do sh still do sugar, and at the same time, you use the waste of the bagas and fermented it with a special technology, and with that part, you can do uh, biofuel ethanol. So that's complement, and then it, it really breaks uh, breaks down the, the issue of food versus right. uh, energy. But it's also yeah quite interesting in terms of uh, bioenergy. Uh, I know also a few projects on using uh, agricultural waste yeah. for the farmers to produce their own energy in some mm -hmm. rural other area, and yeah. those uh, quite uh, uh, important funds. 100% uh, Thai 
uh, big companies investing in uh, the development of that project. You know, so it's yeah, it's yeah. also happening, and yeah. it's not only uh, social business guys that right, right. have the great idea. It's also big, uh, bigger business uh, men investing in this. I think in the developed countries, they are really more, are readily available to Britain, more readily available. And in Europe, in Asia, it's a bit more difficult. You know, we'd like to buy uh, green energy, but how do you get your hands on it? It's a bit more. Unless you go out and build your own biogas facility, which is, you know, quite challenging. Yeah. Yeah. There's only one offer of, of green energy that's uh, State enterprise. Yeah, so and it's, it's only yeah. hydro at the moment. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think uh, that, is, that is developed by, yeah. So yeah, you have a lot of biogas uh, uh, local, yeah. about a few thousand or something like that, what you call them the VSPP program. Mm -hmm. That's usually your factory that has waste and then uh, uses the waste to create energy and for their own, most of their own. Well, that's, that, that is um, substantial. Yeah. It's a substantial part. Yeah, that's a good point because we are we are living in that. You know, we use a lot of um, uh, LBG gas in our know, production, so we're looking to replace that. So that's that's going to be one of our focus. You know. But those systems, because I'm using it, I <coughs> we have some resource, and we're actually using those uh, <coughs> the waste. Yeah. But uh, the systems that you can buy and implement, I think they are not sufficient for yeah. a big factory yet because it's more like household systems that you can buy and we can run 24 rooms and there's easily can do the kitchen stuff but not a, <coughs> not a factory. Even, um, even our suppliers yeah. that we went to look at, you know, the footprint for this, this biofuel is, is as half as big as a factory. <laughs> so so it, it just finding the footprint for it. And when we're kind of landlocked as well in, in, in uh, industrial estate, so it, it is kind of challenging. The windmill is under <laughs> severely under questionable uh, whether that's actually saving energy. <laughs> in, the, in the Netherlands, is it from the actual cost of making the windmill? Well, I definitely want to simulate our net impact network. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Forward, yeah. You know, into 2015, and some of our members are very passionate about the like, fishery and you know, energy. Um, so I think we, we do have some homework to put together if we you know if we're yeah. willing to put in the time and the resources to work together. And, um, so we can continue with that, that conversation. Alex has a lot of experience from the yeah. alternative energy so Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, if there are any more questions I would like to invite us all to give Sonia another round of applause. Uh, <laughs> Thank you.